I'm an Associate Dean of the Faculty at Westmont and a Professor of Biology, and it's great to be with you this evening. What a great crowd we have here. It is my honor to introduce our speaker, my colleague tonight, um, but before I do that, I've been instructed to give just a few announcements. If you're a regular attender of these Westmont Downtown series, and um, make sure you hit our, our last one of the year, it's going to be Dr. Amanda Sparkman from my department from biology. This is going to be April 16th on a Thursday. Uh, and the title is a, a Snake in the Spring Rain, How Global Biodiversity is Responding to a Changing Climate. So, she, and she's a great, I mean, she's top of our field in research and a great speaker, so I encourage you to come out for that. Again, that was April 16th, okay, right here. Uh, also, we, ha we still have some tickets left for President's Breakfast. Uh, that is going to be March 6th, and that is with Daniel Kahneman. Uh, so go to the Westmont website to buy tickets for that, so March 6th. Uh, and Daniel Kahneman, if you don't recognize that name, that's the author of Thinking Fast and Slow. So on to the introduction. Uh, well, I cannot think of a better person to talk about this timely and important topic of civility. A graduate of Westmont College himself, Dr. Jim Taylor, went on to get two master's degrees, one in theology from the Fuller Theological Seminary and one in philosophy from the University of Arizona, and then that is where he went on to get his PhD in philosophy as well. Jim's areas of specialty in his, in his field are epistemology, uh, philosophy of religion, philosophy of language, modern philosophy, and Christian apologetics. His first academic post was actually at Bowling Green State University, but then we got him back here at Westmont in 1994, where he joined the philosophy department. And his accomplishments and contributions have just been many at Westmont. Uh, a clear communicator, a diligent instructor, um, Jim has helped many of our students think more carefully and wisely about what they believe and why and has, have also helped them to learn the important lessons of listening and deliberating well with others. Jim's focus is both on the head and the heart, and his scholarship often focuses on where thoughts and actions meet. Jim's most recently published book is called Learning for Wisdom, Christian Education and the Good Life. Great book, by the way. Uh, and then his latest book project, I think he's wrapping this one up, uh, but it's Knowing God Through Spiritual Practices, an Epistemology of Spiritual Formation. So look for that one out soon. Jim is known at Westmont for his warm collegiality, his extraordinary ability to bring clarity and to complex entangled issues, and his humble and honest manner in tackling challenging discourse. So Jim, we look forward to what you, have, uh, what you have to share with us on your reflections on civility and how we can embody this virtue in ourselves and our spheres of influence. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Eileen, for that very kind introduction. And it's so good to see so many people out tonight uh, postponing their dinner in order to think and talk together about a very important issue, something I'm sure all of you are concerned about. Uh, the culture of incivility, really, that we're looking at in our nation at present. And uh, so the title of my talk, Character Matters, uh, Civility in Uncivil Times. What I'd like to do first is to give you a feel for what I'm going to do in the presentation by uh, talking about each of the areas of the presentation. So first of all, I'm just going to, after uh, showing some examples of incivility and how our general culture is unfortunately characterized by that, at least in the public sphere, uh, we'll talk about the importance of civility as uh, a solution, as an antidote to that. But then the question is, how do we do that? How do we get that? And I think the, the, the answer is we have to become better people in general, and that's really a matter of character. And uh, so we'll talk about how uh, bad character leads to incivility, good character to civility. But then my focus will turn to a special kind of character, an aspect of character, really, and that's intellectual character. Because not only are we treating each other badly uh, in the public sphere, but we're also uh, not being very respectful of each other's ideas. And uh, that's an intellectual matter. So that's where we'll turn at that point. A couple meanings of the word civil. 
So uh, one of the meanings is what we have in mind when we talk about civil rights, uh, civil service, civil disobedience, civil unrest, civil war. Uh, in these particular cases, what we're talking about is something that has to do with citizens of or relating to citizens and their concerns. That's not my focus tonight with the use of the word civil and civility. Rather, I'm talking about civility or civil in the sense of being respectful. That's, uh, that's going to be our focus. And so um, one other thing we can say about these two different uses is that when we use the word in the first sense, we're really describing something. For instance, if we talk about a, a country or a nation that's uh, undergoing a civil war, we're describing something taking place between the citizens of that nation. And of course, in a civil war, people aren't being very civil with each other. Uh, sec in the second use of the term, we're not describing, we're evaluating. We're talking about, uh, in particular, speech or discourse, the way people communicate with each other. And there are good ways of communicating, bad ways. Uh, civil discourse is respectful discourse, that's good ways of talking. Uncivil discourse, disrespectful discourse, bad ways of talking. So, uh, evaluating ourselves uh, tonight. Now, there are lots of examples that we could come up with, uh, just from today's news, probably. I didn't look at today's news, but I'm sure you could find some, uh, of, an, of incivility. And uh, no particular social group is exempt, right? People in every uh, religious group or political party, uh, people in every race or class, who was pres presiding over the proceedings had to stop everything and tell both the Republicans and the Democrats to shape up and start behaving. Here's what he said. He said, at this point, I think it is appropriate for me to admonish both sides in equal terms to remember that they are addressing the world's greatest deliberative body. One reason it has earned that title is because its members avoid speaking in a manner and using language that is not conducive to civil discourse. So Justice Roberts then, recognizing the problem, calling it out, really. And uh, we've seen this happening, unfortunately, so much in our public sphere and among our leaders in particular. But of course, uh, private individuals are in uncivil with each other as well. Um, uncivil behaviors you can find, for instance, online include name calling, insults, snubs, threats, and even outright violence. And you know, the range of social media outlets available for expressing incivility is, uh, uh, well, there's quite a, quite a few different ways. And now private individuals uh, who in the past weren't able to express themselves uh, this way quite so regularly and widely and boldly are now able to do so, especially with the anonymity that often goes along with uh, posting. So for instance, just go to various uh, comment sections on uh, social media sites or any site, really a newspaper site, and you'll often see uncivil posts by uh, uncivil internet trolls in particular, people who like to just go and, and say something mean just because they want to be mean. And not only that, but of course the daily Twitter feed is full of all kinds of callous, crude, mean-spirited, and profane remarks that people make either about or to each other. And you know, without intending to be partisan, I might as well call attention to the elephant in the room right now, tonight, and just at the outset mention that I think a big problem is uh, President Donald Trump's tweets. And uh, as a matter of fact, since 2015, when he declared his candidacy for president, the New York Times has been keeping track of them. So here we have uh, the 598 people, places, and things that Donald Trump has insulted on Twitter, a complete list. Uh, I believe when they started, there weren't 598, but they've been uh, updating it every few months. The last update was in May of 2019. But if you want to find out uh, who he's insulting or what he's insulting, apparently, you can just go to this resource and they'll have a record of uh, all of his insulting tweets. Well, the authors, um, uh, have also, uh, well, authors on the Forbes magazine's website as well have uh, posted an article entitled Donald Trump's 10 Most Offensive Tweets. 
And uh, they've listed these 10 uh, most offensive tweets from least offensive to most offensive. I'm, I'll just go through the list with you, starting at the, uh, at the most tame, apparently. Clown, dummy, phony, lightweight, dopey, truly weird spoiled brat, pathetic, terrible, angry, obnoxious, low-class snob, and finally, last but not least, perv sleazebag. Well, you have to admit that he's creative. He's got a lot of variety, right? Um, so uh, this uh, is a problem, and he continues, of course, to uh, use offensive language uh, to uh, describe his targets. And um, so most recently, even back in, in May, he was still using such words as loser, lightweight, sleepy, crooked, and dumb. Now, while I'm not here this evening to criticize uh, President Trump, I do think it's important for my purposes to point out that what he's doing here is at least a symptom of a much wider incivility problem we're facing in our society. And certainly, at, to some extent, it's a contributing factor. And, um, you know, he's certainly not being... Um, discouraging, uh, I think more encouraging of people who want to follow his example. He's not the first one in our nation. There have been plenty of times in our nation that historians can tell us uh, where there have been a lot of uncivil communications between our citizens, and he's certainly not the only one. But you know, as, as the President of the United States, as the leader of the free world, he's got a lot of power and influence. And uh, I think that uh, we need to be careful not to follow his example. And furthermore, you know, recent surveys have indicated that Americans are aware of this problem and are concerned about it. So I'll just run through a list of uh, recent survey results. So 74% of Americans think public manners and behavior have deteriorated. 84% consider that the country is divided on our most important values. 93% identify a deficit of civility in the workplace and the public square. 69% classify a lack of civility as a major problem. And 79% across all political parties are concerned that incivility will lead to violence. Now the possibility of violence is not the only problem with our incivility today. One reason that, inc that uh, incivility matters is that it can, one reason civility matters, excuse me, is that incivility can lead to physical harm. And that's a safety problem. But civility matters for other reasons as well. Our incivility also poses other problems, a moral problem. Uh, we owe it to each other to treat each other with respect. Everyone is deserving of at least some respect. A practical problem, our incivility is keeping us from working together to solve our difficult practical problems as a nation. And a knowledge problem. Our incivility is an obstacle to our finding answers to key questions insofar as we are unwilling to talk to people uh, with whom we disagree about important and controversial matters. So let's look at uh, these last three problems a little bit more carefully. The moral problem, the practical problem, and the knowledge problem. And uh, so first of all, incivility then, a moral problem, again, because every human being has a right to be treated with at least a minimal amount of respect. Uh, we owe it to each other to treat each other respectfully. And uh, Aretha Franklin famously expressed a desire for her man to treat her with just a little bit of respect. And why is that? Well, because anything less than that would be dehumanizing. You know, we're all human beings. We all have the same DNA. We all have the same fundamental needs. And uh, in many cases, we have the same general hopes, dreams, and desires. And uh, moreover, uh, according to the Judeo-Christian religious tradition, uh, we're created in God's image. And that's what gives us our dignity as human beings and is the ground, according to uh, Jews and Christians anyway, for our need, our obligation really, to treat each other with respect. But even if you're not a religious person, you can still appeal to our common humanity as a basis for uh, the duty we all have to treat each other humanely. 
and our incivility then posing a practical problem because our disrespect for each other is polarizing. As a result of our rising discourtesy, we're becoming more divided from each other and our mounting antagonism then makes it more difficult for us to work together to solve our common problems. Our current leaders' ineffective feuding about how to improve our healthcare and immigration systems uh, is an example of that. Of course, there are legitimate disagreements about values and priorities, among other things. And, uh, but the poor treatment, we, uh, the way we treat each other so poorly keeps us from listening carefully, respectfully, understanding and appreciating each other's point of view, even when we don't agree with each other. You know, as fellow humans, we all know what it's like, I think, unfortunately, uh, to be trying to work with somebody with whom uh, we don't get along and, and that we know doesn't really value us. And, and so we can, it's no surprise then that uh, our public figures are having the same issue when they're trying to work together with people that don't value them. And finally, uh, the third major problem here, in addition to the safety problem, that incivility uh, is a knowledge problem because in our pursuit of truth together, uh, we just aren't willing to listen to each other when we disagree with each other about important and controversial matters. A lot of our disrespect for each other involves a dismissal of each other's opinions. When it comes to many of the hot button issues that divide us, we tend to think that anyone who disagrees with us is either stupid or immoral. Just, uh, just think about how people react on both sides to those who hold contrary positions on abortion, immigration, gun control, and climate change. If we dismiss the views of our fellow citizens about such issues on the ground that anyone with adequate intelligence or commitment to the common good would disagree with them, then we're unlikely to have meaningful conversations with them about these things. And if we don't talk to each other, we miss opportunities to learn truths we might otherwise know and to discover false beliefs we didn't know we had. In short, we risk getting stuck in a limited or even distorted perspective about the way things are and the way things should be. So, in sum, uh, the problems that we're facing because of our incivility include uh, a risk of violence, uh, diminishment of our moral integrity, uh, prevention of our ability to solve our practical problems, and an obstacle to our uh, learning more, understanding better, knowing more. So here's the question, what can we do about these problems? Incivility causing all these problems. Uh, what can, and by the way, I've come, recently come across a book that I wish I had found before I put my talk together, a book entitled Love Your Enemies by Arthur Brooks. Has anybody else heard of this or seen it? I, good, somebody back there. Uh, recently come out, subtitle How Decent People Can Save America from the Culture of Contempt. Uh, another way to talk about our incivility is our tendency uh, on both sides, in the public sphere at least, to be contemptuous of each other. And uh, this is keeping us, this is really creating all these problems. He points out that in addition to the problems I've identified, is a more serious problem of uh, our even a, a being able to keep our union together, to maintain our democracy. So it's a serious problem. And the question then, how can we solve it? Well, if incivility is the problem, then it seems like civility ought to be the solution. And I think it is, but then the question is, well, how can we do that? How can we become more civil with each other? And I think, uh, really, the solution has to do with character. That is, it has to do with something more fundamental, psychologically speaking, which is at the root of our uh, civility and incivility, at the root of our attitudes and behaviors, the kind of people we are, whether we're good people or bad people. Your character is what makes you the kind of person you are, characteristically, usually. It's what disposes you to think, feel, and act in some ways rather than other ways. People with good characters think, feel, and act in typically good ways, and people with bad characters think, feel, and act in typically bad ways. And so, for instance, as an example, uh, why do we admire Mother Teresa? 
Well, it's not merely because of what she said or what she did. We uh, admire her because uh, of the kind of person she was. We admire her because she was a good person. And another question, why is it that we despise Adolf Hitler? Well, again, it's not because of what he said or did. Well, certainly, uh, we don't like those things, but more fundamentally, it's because of the kind of person he was, the, a person who says or said or did those kinds of things, uh, a bad person, right? Now, of course, most of us are somewhere on the character continuum, thankfully, between Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler. We aren't nearly so good as the saint, nor as bad as the tyrant, but all of us have characters, and all of our characters are good in some respects and not so good in other respects. Now, it might seem okay to you to classify generally recognized saints like Mother Teresa as good and generally acknowledged scoundrels like Adolf Hitler as bad. But some of you might be feeling a little bit hesitant about evaluating or appraising other people's behaviors, attitudes, and characters. For one thing, you might think that our moral judgments about ourselves and about each other are just a matter of opinion. Well, uh, let's turn to an ancient philosopher, Aristotle, who developed a moral theory which made character fundamental. He had a response to this worry, the idea that uh, morality or ethics is just a matter of opinion. On his view, morality is what has to do with, objectively speaking, uh, enables us to flourish, uh, provides for human thriving and well-being or welfare. So according to Aristotle, a person is morally good to the extent that he or she is able to thrive as a human being and is also able to live in such a way as to contribute to human flourishing. And a person is morally bad to the extent that that person doesn't thrive and either doesn't contribute to human flourishing or actually positively undermines human welfare. And so that's why we hold up Mother Teresa as an example of a virtuous person and condemn, condemn Adolf Hitler as a vicious person. Because Mother Teresa was a compassionate and generous person, she acted in compassionate and generous ways. And as a result, she contributed to the well-being of the people that she served. And because Adolf Hitler was uh, a violent and bigoted person, he acted in violent and bigoted ways and he uh, undermined the welfare and well-being of the people that he enslaved. So it's really not just a matter of opinion, but has to do really with uh, important matters about human flourishing. And just in summary, then, a person has a good character when he or she tends to act in such ways to promote human welfare, and a person has a bad character when either they don't promote human welfare or uh, they actually undermine it. Now, another reason that you might hesitate to evaluate another person's character is that you might think that it's just not okay for us to judge each other. Many people think that being critical of another person is to be wrongly intolerant of them. Shouldn't we just live and let live? After all, who are we to think we know what another person should be like or how they should live? Doesn't everyone have the right to become the kind of whatever kind of person they want to be? Uh, aren't those who assess other people's characters just meddlesome busybodies? And moreover, to turn to uh, an authority figure, didn't Jesus say, do not judge so that you may not be judged? And he goes on to say in this passage in the Sermon on the Mount, for with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye. So this is, this is a major concern, right? I'm, I'm talking about, uh, I'm inviting us to evaluate people's behavior, and now we have good, some reasons for thinking that we shouldn't be doing that. Well, let me address uh, these important concerns. First, uh, tolerance of another person doesn't require approval of them, nor, is it, nor does it mean that we can't express our disapproval of their behavior. It just means that we shouldn't force them to change. Trying to persuade each other to become better people is perfectly okay. Second, we United States citizens are all part of the same nation. 
And just as the health of our individual bodies depends on the harmonious interaction of the parts of our bodies, so also the health of our body politic depends on the harmonious interaction of us citizens who compose it. It's in our, uh, because uh, uh, the kind of character we have determines how we behave and how we interact with each other, it's in our best interest not only to uh, work on our own characters and try to improve, but also to, uh, well, kindly, generously try to persuade each other uh, to become better people as well. And not only that, but getting back to Jesus here, um, let's look at his uh, admonition to us in context and, and realize that Jesus meant only to prohibit judging others by a standard that one is not willing to apply to oneself. That becomes clear when you look at what he goes on to say at the end of the passage. He says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. So really, the idea then is uh, don't criticize, you, you, you may criticize others, but just get your own act together first. And you know, thinking about what Jesus said there, uh, is, is it's good to reflect on how hard it is actually to uh, see clearly when we do criticize others. You know, for one thing, we never know a person's whole story. Uh, from a limited perspective, it might seem to us that uh, something that uh, looks like a blameworthy fault, uh, well, excuse me, uh, from a limited perspective, it might seem that uh, something about somebody is a blameworthy fault, but from a broader perspective, it might become clear that it's really uh, a consequence of uh, unfortunate circumstances. And for another thing, it's really hard to be impartial, right? We, ha we, are, we tend to be easier on ourselves than we are on other people. And finally, uh, none of us is exempt from criticism. Uh, each of us needs to improve ourselves in various ways. And so we need to be careful when we criticize and evaluate others. That's why I think that Jesus' warning is really uh, a call uh, to us to start the improvement process with ourselves, to begin the character evaluation process with our own case and ask ourselves these questions. What kind of person am I? What kind of character do I have? Uh, how do I interact with other people? Am I, am I acting in ways that are uh, generous and life-giving or am I acting in ways that will undermine human welfare? And, you know, I think we'd all be better off if we asked ourselves these questions and once we had the answers, engaged in uh, self-improvement before we go on and uh, try to encourage others to improve their characters. But uh, this focus on character leads to another question about what we mean in particular by character. I've given you some general ideas here. But more specifically, what does our character consist in? Well, our characters are composed of a collection of relatively fixed or settled dispositions or character traits. And we have labels for these character traits. For instance, some people have the character trait of generosity. They're generally generous people. And other people have the character trait of stinginess. They are generally stingy people. Character traits we rightly admire, we call virtues, and those we properly disapprove of, we call vices. Clearly, since we rightly admire generous people, generosity is a virtue, and since we properly are critical of stingy people, stinginess is a vice. Why is it that Dickens' Christmas Carol, uh, or A Christmas Carol, is a much beloved classic? How many of you like that book, uh, A Christmas Carol? Love to hear it every Christmas. You know, the reason I think, I think the reason we like it is because it's a story about a person who starts out being stingy and ends up being generous. In the first chapter, Ebenezer Scrooge is a thoroughly unlikable character. He's selfish, mean, and stingy. In the last chapter, he's eminently admirable. He's unselfish, kind, and generous. We love this story, not only because it features a person who undergoes a radical uh, transformation of character, because, but, but also because um, it can inspire us to improve our own uh, characters as well. So we look at, at Ebenezer Scrooge and look at the way in which he starts out, out being inclined or disposed to hurt people and uh, see how he ends up being someone who's motivated 
uh, to help people and contribute to their well-being. And it's inspiring, it's motivating. Now getting back to Aristotle, Aristotle taught that the good life is a life lived in a good community, and a good community is a community full of good people, people with good characters, people who are disposed to do things that contribute to, to uh, human flourishing. And he also taught that the way that we acquire and develop virtuous characters is to find virtuous people and make it an habitual practice to emulate them. And you know, that is exactly, as some of you may know, what David Brooks had in mind when he wrote the recent book, The Road to Character. Uh, every chapter, except for the first and the last, features at least one individual that David Brooks holds up uh, to us as an example for us to admire and to uh, emulate. Every one of these people prioritized, you might recall what Brooks called eulogy virtues, the kinds of things that we hope that people will say about us at our memorial service in their eulogy for us, the kinds of things we want to re be remembered for. Uh, eulogy virtues are praiseworthy character traits of the sorts that uh, would include such things as kindness, bravery, honesty, and faithfulness. And this is in contrast to what he calls resume virtues, the kinds of skills we list on our resume that Brooks says you bring to the job market and that contribute to your external success, right? His, tendency, his focus in this book was on our tendency to emphasize our resume virtues more than our eulogy virtues. And he was uh, giving these examples of people who really had the eulogy virtues in mind. He also wrote about how each of these exemplars that he discusses chose, chose to develop uh, their characters through ongoing deliberate choices that involved a willingness to make sacrifices. This comes out clearly in his chapter titles uh, such as self-conquest, struggle, self-mastery, and self-examination. And the role of each person's voluntary decision, choice, and commitment in the process explains why we admire, praise, and commend them. No one becomes a virtuous person naturally and automatically. We make our characters, both good and bad. We aren't born with them. And because we choose, because we, we work hard at it and make them, that's what makes them admirable. So I think we can use the concepts of a person's character and the concept of character traits to think about civility and incivility. Civil attitudes and behaviors are admirable, and uncivil attitudes and behaviors aren't. So civility is a virtue, and incivility is a vice. I hope you can see which one is civil and which one isn't there. <laughs> civil people contribute to our collective well-being by their strong tendency to treat others with respect, and uncivil people either fail to foster human welfare or diminish it by treating others disrespectfully. If all of us worked harder at becoming civil people, we'd all be better off. Our increased collective civility would at least go a long way towards solving our moral problem. At a minimum, we'd be treating each other as we deserve to be treated. And this would mean that we'd be fulfilling an important moral obligation we have to each other. Furthermore, if each of us strove to become a more civil person, we would also be more likely to work together to solve our practical problems, and we would have less reason to be concerned about harsh words leading to violent behavior. But there is an important and even essential requirement for completely civil behavior that we haven't yet discussed. Intellectual character. Our current incivility involves, as I said earlier, not just our being dismissive of each other, but of our being dismissive of each other's ideas. And, and this form of disrespect is a failure of intellectual character. Respect for each other's ideas, even if you don't agree with them, is an intellectual virtue. And disrespect for each other's ideas is an intellectual vice, a defect of intellectual character. Such a character defect is what causes the knowledge problem I mentioned above. When we don't respect the opinions of others with whom we disagree, we miss out on an opportunity to learn from them and perhaps even to be corrected by them. Since none of us is omniscient, none of us knows everything. And since none of us is infallible, 
None of us can be confident that everything we believe is true. In short, um, when we don't listen to each other because we don't consider their viewpoints worth thinking about and discussing, we prevent ourselves from possibly growing in knowledge and also from possibly revising our perspective for the better. In addition, since many of our thorny practical problems require policy solutions based on assumptions about what's true and about what's not, we can solve those practical problems only if we achieve enough agreement with each other about what, the, what can be known, what the facts are. That is, we can solve many of our practical problems only if we solve our knowledge problem together. Now, there are people on all sides of our current debates about controversial issues who consider their opponent's views too uninformed, irrational, foolish, immoral, or unjust to be worth taking seriously enough for discussion. But how reasonable is it to think that the members of one political group are generally and substantially better educated, smarter, and more committed to the common good than the members of the, of the other or the other political groups? There are intelligent and good people all across the political spectrum. So it's generally unreasonable and uncivil to reject the opinion of a political opponent on the grounds that their viewpoint is so deficient intellectually and morally as to be unworthy of consideration and conversation. Of course, there are bad ideas that no intelligent and decent person, person should take seriously. So for instance, Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, published in 1791, is a case in point. Actually, the whole title of Swift's, Swift's essay is a model, or excuse me, a modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people from being a burden to their parents or country and for making them beneficial to the public. And his proposal is that the impoverished, sorry, the impoverished Irish people could ease their economic troubles by selling their children as food to rich ladies and gentlemen. Yikes. Obviously, Swift's proposal wasn't worthy of serious consideration except as he intended it, which was as a satirical exaggeration designed to ridicule British aristocratic neglect of the poor and to expose unjust British policies toward the Irish. So uh, hoping that people uh, realize that it was a satire. But the policy proposals made in our contemporary public sphere are rarely so obviously beyond the pale. So for the most part, we should be willing to dignify them by at least being open to discussing them respectfully. Here are two contemporary examples of uncivil behavior involving ridicule of other people's views on a current controversial issue. The first features a person on the right, the conservative end of the political spectrum, and the second involves a person on the left, the liberal or progressive end of the pol political spectrum. First, for the conservative, Lenar Whitney is a Republican former member of the Louisiana House of Representatives. In connection with her 2014 bid for a seat in Louisiana's 6th Congressional District, Whitney released a video titled Global Warming is a Hoax, in which she describes belief in global warming as a delusion and as perhaps the greatest deception in the history of mankind. She claims that any 10-year-old can invalidate the global warming thesis with one of the simplest scientific devices known to man, a thermometer. Now, Whitney's rhetoric here clearly implies that anyone who believes that the thesis of global warming is true is deficient intellectually in virtue of being deluded, and that at least the scientists who have advanced the claim are deficient morally in virtue of being deceivers. In other words, anyone who believes the global warming thesis to be true is either an ignoramus or a liar. One author who commented on Whitney's language in the video characterized it as involving, quote, problematic and uncivil exaggeration, oversimplification, and distortion of the truth, unquote. Now, of course, again, my, I'm illustrating here, there, there's incivility in the political sphere, but it's not isolated to just one particular political group. Here's the guy on the left. Another contemporary example uh, involving uh, a, a liberal or progressive. 
In a New York Magazine article titled, Why I'm So Mean, Jonathan Chait criticizes a column by Veronique de Rougui in which de Rougui argues that the U.S. tax code is more progressive than those of most other countries. Chait describes his ensuing exchange with de Rougui as follows. I wrote a response noting that this reasoning is completely idiotic. De Rougui's reply is an incoherent collection of hand-waving that does not come close to addressing this very simple and fatal flaw with her claim. She introduces a series of fallacies. It's a simple case of her making up false claims based on extremely elementary errors. Well, it turns out that the target of Chait's uncivil critique, Veronique de Rougui, is a nationally syndicated columnist with a PhD in economics. She's also on the end of the political spectrum opposite from Chait, so it's no surprise that he disagrees with a claim she makes in an area of policy that tends to divide the left from the right. But how likely is it that a person with de Rougui's credentials would engage in completely idiotic reasoning that involves a simple and fatal flaw involving making up false claims based on extremely elementary errors, or that she would engage in an incoherent collection of hand-waving in reply to Chait's criticism. What these examples of uncivil speech demonstrate from both sides of the political spectrum is a deficiency of good character, a lack of virtue. But the character flaws in each case are intellectual. They are failures of intellectual character. A person's intellectual character is the character that person has as a thinker, learner, or inquirer, or to put it another way, the set of dispositions to act, think, and feel in various ways in the context of thinking, learning, or inquiring. When Aristotle developed his virtue theory of ethics or morality, whoops, sorry, I bet you recognize that guy. When Aristotle developed his virtue theory of ethics and morality, he included intellectual virtues along with moral virtues as characteristics of good people, people who both flourish intellectually and also, so, sorry, people who uh, uh, flourish morally and intellectually and contribute to the welfare of others. To be good people who characteristic characteristically contribute to the common good, we need to be people who live well in general and who think well in particular. Such people will respect both other people and their ideas. A recent NewsHawk article focused on former Santa Barbara City Council member, here he is, whoops, sorry, the wrong way, Randy Rouse. There you go, now you can look at him. Who attended his final council meeting last month because of term limits after nine years of serving on the city council. The author of this NewsHawk article about Randy uh, quotes city councilwoman Megan Harmon as saying the following about Rouse. In this day and age, when we are all so dug in and things can feel so intractable, Randy is an amazing example of our ability to actually engage in new ideas and to have hard conversations, and to do so without losing sight of our own true north. Even in our most heated debates, Councilmember Rouse treats me and most importantly, my ideas, with fundamental respect. He listens, he engages, he asks questions. Harmon is describing Randy Rouse as a civil and intellectually virtuous person. Her characterization of him provides a stark contrast with both Lenore Whitney and Jonathan Chait. So with those examples in mind of, go of both uh, intellectually unvirtuous or vicious behavior and intellectually virtuous uh, attitudes and behavior. Question, what strengths of mind would an ideal thinker, learner, or inquirer possess, at least for general intellectual purposes? Let's think about what good thinkers are like. It's clear that such a person must be intelligent, knowledgeable, and intellectually skilled in various ways, including good at reading, good at writing, good at remembering things, and good at logical reasoning, among other things. Right? Think, all right, sounds like a pretty smart person, a pretty intelligent person. What else could be required for being excellent as a thinker and learner and inquirer? Well, 
though these cognitive traits may be necessary for intellectual excellence, they aren't sufficient. Think about this. Lenore Whitney and Jonathan Chait are both educated, intelligent, and generally intellectually gifted people. And yet, these mental qualities didn't prevent them from uncharitably and uncivilly dismissing viewpoints put forward by experts on the topics under discussion. Experts with whom they have fundamental political disagreements. It seems clear that what is lacking on their part is not intellectual ability, but instead a willingness to humbly and open-mindedly consider the possibility that a political opponent might be right on an important issue. And their unwillingness is a character flaw, a deficiency in intellectual virtue. In short, ideal thinkers, learners, and inquirers must be smart, knowledgeable, and mentally skilled, sure. But that's not enough. As one commentator puts it, quote, a person can be highly intelligent, knowledgeable, and intellectually skilled while also being intellectually lazy, arrogant, aggressive, careless, hasty, superficial, close-minded, fearful, dishonest, and quick to give up. That's a lot of vices that can go along with being a smart person. So what's required then for intellectual excellence is not just intelligence, knowledge, and skill, but intellectual virtues. And a, a good character then, good intellectual character consisting in these intellectual virtues. These intellectual virtues include qualities like curiosity, attentiveness, intellectual humility, intellectual autonomy, open-mindedness, thoroughness, intellectual tenacity, intellectual courage, wisdom, and a love for the truth. Now, perhaps a love for the truth is the most important intellectual virtue. Why is it that there is so much incivility in public discourse today that involves dismissing each other's ideas as being unworthy of discussion? One reason is that many of us care more about appearing to have things figured out than we do about risking looking foolish by admitting that we might be wrong. In that case, we love our reputation more than we love the truth. And we have the vice of intellectual pride rather than the virtue of intellectual humility. Another reason many of us aren't willing to listen respectfully to the other side is that we tend to care more about pleasing our group than we do about making sure we've got the truth. People who really want to know what's true will be willing to disagree with the members of their family, religious group, or political party if necessary. If we're afraid to take a stand on a controversial issue because we fear disapproval or rejection, then we love satisfying our tribe more than we love the truth. So, if so, we have the vice of intellectual cowardice rather than the virtue of intellectual courage. In his book on ethics, Aristotle discussed his disagreement with his teacher Plato about an important philosophical theory. He himself wrestled with the temptation to pri prioritize his friendship with Plato over his love of the truth. But he ends up choosing the intellectually virtuous, virtuous path. He writes, Yet surely it would be thought better, or rather necessary, above all for philosophers, to sacrifice even views of friends to which one is attached, since although both are dear, that is, both the views of one's friends and the truth, uh, it is right to give preference to the truth. So he's a good model for us in this respect. And since a philosopher is a lover of wisdom, which includes knowledge of important truths, then insofar as each of us aspires to know important truths, each of us is a philosopher. Welcome to the club. So each of us ought to pursue the truth for its own sake, rather than to favor positions just because they're popular among members of our tribe. So people with strong and good intellectual characters will love the truth more than they love their own reputation or love pleasing their group. And they will be, therefore, intellectually humble in being willing to admit that they may be wrong or can at least learn things from their opponents. They will also be intellectually courageous in being willing to risk being criticized or even ostracized by members of their own group. Finally, they will be open-minded, fair-minded, intellectually generous, and charitable by putting their adversary's opponent, uh, sorry, but by putting their adversary's opinions in the best possible light. 
In sum, having a generally morally virtuous character, uh, just emphasizing morally at this point, a general morally virtuous character is required for being habitually civil to other people. Whether one likes them or not, it's second nature for a civil person to treat others with respect, even their political opponents. And having an intellectually virtuous character is required for being willing seriously to entertain and discuss moral, social, political, and religious viewpoints that one doesn't accept. Intellectually civil people, people with sufficiently high regard for the truth, will treat the ideas of their opponents, adversaries, and even enemies with respect. As a result, we'll do our moral duty to treat others and their ideas with the respect they deserve. We'll be able to work together to, in spite of our differences to discover the truth and to solve our common problems. And we'll live in such a way as to be generally safer and more harmonious in our society. Well, I suspect that not everybody will agree with everything I've said. Uh, as a matter of fact, I know that's the case. And I've already found some criticism, some objections some, uh, from looking around. So I'll just show you five. Um, and this will lay the groundwork for the conversation we'll have together in a few minutes. I'm indebted, by the way, to philosopher Jason Baer of Loyola Marymount University uh, for many of the ideas in this section. Well, the first objection is the rational softness objection. So the worry here is that people who are intellectually humble, open-minded, charitable, and generous may be too uncritical and too soft on their opponents' ideas and arguments. And if they're too soft on them, they may let them get away with bad ideas and bad arguments. And this will likely lead us further from the truth, further from knowing what uh, is right, and that rather than closer to it. So that's the concern. In reply, uh, these virtues just listed as soft um, that are, yes, required for intellectual civility need to be accompanied by other virtues, such as intellectual firmness, carefulness, thoroughness, and rigor. A person who loves the truth has all of these intellectual virtues and will be able to strike a balance between sympathetic listening on the one hand and critical questioning on the other. And this balanced approach will focus on the position that is most likely to be true, no matter who holds it. Second concern, second objection, the freedom of speech objection. This concern is that an invitation to more intellectual virtue and civility in public life will end up infringing on our First Amendment right to free speech, and also have a chilling effect that will discourage people from talking to each other about controversial matters about which they disagree. Now, in reply, I have not recommended that we pass laws against treating other people and their ideas uncivilly. I've only urged all of us to try to become more civil people and to attempt to persuade others to do the same. Since persuasion is not coercion, no one's legal right to be as uncivil as they want to be in their speech is threatened or infringed by my argument. Also, merely asking people to be more respectful in their interactions with their ideological opponents is unlikely to have a chilling effect. Instead, it is much more likely to encourage dialogue across party lines. In contrast, uncivil speech is more likely to quench good conversation. The sensitive topics objection. People who raise this objection think efforts to bring about more civility in our public discussions will prevent us from talking together about important but emotionally charged topics, such as race, poverty, and climate change. They assume that people will refrain from discussing these matters if they're trying to be civil due to a fear of offending the people with whom they disagree and further dividing us from each other. My response to this objection is to point out that being civil in the way we interact with other people and their views and arguments doesn't mean that people will never be offended by the content of our views and arguments. Civil people can hold positions that other people find offensive. Civility doesn't require us to avoid subjects and positions some people consider impolite to discuss. Rather, it prohibits, us from being, from, it prohibits us from being offensive in the way that we talk about these subjects and positions with each other. So our ideas, our positions might be offensive to other people. We should try not to be offensive. That's what I'm calling uh, us to consider doing as more civil people. 
Next, uh, the unjust civility objection. Just found this last month uh, in The Atlantic, the December 2019 issue, uh, features an essay by Adam Serwer entitled, Civility is Overrated. You can see why that got my attention. <laughs> Serwer argues that reason calls for civility in our country, calls for us to stop fighting and just get along with each other, tend to put historically marginalized groups at a disadvantage. He refers to Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, in which King famously lamented the white moderate who, quote, prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Serwer is concerned that current calls for civility are really calls for an unjust absence of tension that will favor privileged Americans over Americans who continue to be marginalized. In short, civility can, can be racist and sexist. Now, I have to say I'm quite sympathetic with this objection. I agree with Serwer that efforts to bring about more civility can help some people and hurt others. That's because privileged people can tend to see the complaints of unprivileged people as a divisive disturbance of the peace rather than as a disruptive but legitimate request for justice. But campaigns for increased civility don't have to be covert attempts to maintain an unjust status quo. If a drive toward more civility is accompanied by a recognition of this danger, it needn't fall into that trap. And if, and if those of us who are striving to be more civil people remember that all human beings are deserving of respect, we are unlikely to make our civility into an unjust tool. Martin Luther King Jr. himself is a good model of a civil person who fought for justice. Finally, the beyond the pale objection. This last objection assumes that an, in, that an intellectually virtuous person, a person who is intellectually humble, open-minded, and intellectually charitable, will be willing to take seriously any viewpoint or proposal defended in the public square. But some positions and recommendations are just too unreasonable or unethical to be worthy of careful thought and conversation. They are intellectually beyond the pale. So intellectual virtue and civility will lead us to waste our time discussing ideas and opinions that don't deserve to get a hearing. In reply, intellectual virtue and civility don't require us to be open to obviously irrational claims or immoral suggestions. Swift's modest proposal, which I mentioned earlier, is a case in point. And we can appeal, as they do in the law, to a reasonable person standard to decide what to talk about and what to ignore. But we have to be careful here. Because of our biases, in spite of knowing we aren't always right about things, we can too easily reject an opinion that isn't as unreasonable as we think it is. The 19th century moral and political philosopher John Stuart Mill points out that while everyone well knows himself to be fallible, not to get everything right, few think it's necessary to take precautions against their own, in, their own fallibility. And recent psychological studies have confirmed this tendency in us. So we need to find a good balance between being intellectually careful so as not to waste our time on unworthy uh, ideas and intellectually humble so as to make sure that we don't reject a position worth considering. In other words, we need to have a wide range of intellectual virtues. Now in conclusion, let me just uh, sum up what I've uh, shared with you tonight. I've argued that the current incivility in our society has uh, created a number of problems. A safety problem, a moral problem, a practical problem, and a knowledge problem. And I've contended that we can solve these problems only if we strive together to try to be more civil with each other. In addition, I've claimed that we can increase our collective civility only by striving to become people of good character, people who have the virtue of civility, sorry, yes, the virtue of civility among other virtues. I've also pointed out that since our incivility involves not only disrespecting each other as persons, but also each other's ideas, we need to be people of good intellectual character, as well as people of good moral character. And I spe specified some of the intellectual virtues we need in order to work more effectively together in our pursuit of important truths. These include 
the virtue of loving the truth more than we care about either our own reputation or the approval of others. And these virtues also include intellectual humility, open-mindedness, generosity, and charity. Finally, I listed and replied to some objections that people raise against the positions I've been promoting this evening. I'm sure those aren't the only questions and concerns one might have about what I've said tonight, so I'll stop talking now and invite you to join the conversation with me. What are your comments, questions, and concerns? Uh, I uh, will be happy if you disagree with me, but I, my only uh, request is that you treat me with civility. Thank you. The issue of Hitler uh, set my mind to thinking. Twelve years before he became the bad man, he developed in a country of a population that adored him, mm. believed in him, yeah. and thought he was next to God because he invoked God in his speeches. Mm. It is only after he began to walk into other countries and bomb and uh, shoot on people that he thought were his enemies where people began to change. So he was cons not considered a bad person mm. for uh, a dozen years. He developed a, a, a following. And what did it was the economy. Mm. The economy was very bad when he came in, and he gave these people jobs and uh, uh, brought their uh, egos up and they could live the middle class life. And why should they follow him? He was giving them a good life. Yes. Yeah, so the uh, comment here is that uh, with respect to Hitler, uh, initially, let's say 12 years before uh, he was recognized as as an evil person. He was thought by his own people to be a good person, and he, he was really admired. Uh, and part of that because he was uh, helping, he started with a, with a bad economy, and he helped them with their economy, got them jobs. And, uh, and there were a few American intellectuals that supported him? There were even American intellectuals who supported him, yeah, there was. As well as within the country itself. Yeah. I mean, if you take uh, Braun, who invented these machineries that went into space, he, he didn't make any judgments about Hitler. Yeah, I think what this what this illustrates is the important uh, that all importance for all of us uh, again uh, to pay attention to what's really true and good uh, rather than what's to our advantage, or rather you know for instance it might be to our advantage to have the economy uh, getting better. And we have something going on right now. We have an adoration group with Mr. Trump. Well, I'm going to try to be nonpartisan tonight, but I'll, she said we, we have the same thing going on now with an adoration group of Mr. Trump, and I'll just let that be uh, her comment. So, excuse me. Um, I don't have any of those same objections that you put on the slide, but... You got another objection. Yeah. Good. I'm, I'm wondering if you could explain just kind of fundamentally your, your whole approach, like why do you think it's so helpful to go at character Ah. As opposed to just addressing the behavior itself. Yeah, good. An example of that is, as a parent and as a teacher, you know, like, if I catch one of my kids not sharing a toy or a mountain bike, whatever their age is, I'm, you know, I, it seems like it's not so productive to address them. It's like, you're selfish, you're, you are selfish. Like, why are you mm. selfish? Yeah. Instead, I'm going to be like, well, you would be, you know, what you did might be, You're going to get along better with your brother if you share. And by the same token, if I as a teacher, if I catch a student cheating, I'm not going to address that student as you're a fundamentally dishonest person. You need to change that. I'm going to assume they're a good person and that they made a mistake. I'm going to address that mistake. And so I wonder, because you seem, as we all are, I mean, you're obviously very concerned about her. Mm. Why you think, why you, or you're very concerned about civility? Yeah. What? Why is it so useful to go fundamentally at this abstract notion of character? Hmm, Why yeah. Talk about the, just the, yeah, just, just uh, behave more, yeah. Okay, so really interesting question here. So um, the concern is that I'm focusing on character as the root cause of our incivility and really as the, uh, what needs to improve in order for us to become civil. And you're suggesting that uh, it might be better if we just uh, try to change our behavior. Uh, and you use some examples of, for instance, uh, with your children or with your students uh, who do something wrong, correcting them rather than saying you're a bad person, you're a selfish person. Um, well, I agree with you that 
uh, it's, it's not a very effective method if you want someone to change their behavior to tell them that they're a bad person. That's not going to go very far. But um, it does seem to me that uh, the way we work as human beings is such that um, how we tend to behave over time is a function of a long process of development uh, of having acquired a certain kind of character, probably as a result of a lot of interventions by uh, parents and teachers and others who do correct our behavior over time. But the end result of that is that there's something deeper that's going on, something that becomes more deeply rooted, and that is a disposition over time uh, to tend automatically to behave in the, in the best ways. And, uh, and, I, and, and I think that, that we've all got that mechanism in us. And for some of us, it's kind of late, uh, actually, because our characters are pretty well formed at this point. I think really, uh, if there's anything that can be done that it would be more hopeful, it would be with our, with the, with our children. Uh, to pay more attention about what kinds of character education they're getting. Uh, I don't know if, that's, if that uh, satisfies you or not, but it just seems to me that merely to correct behavior is not to get to the root of the problem. Although, again, uh, that would be a good method over time of helping people develop a better character. Uh, I heard some uh, references to eulogy yeah. virtues and resume virtues. Could you give uh, some examples of the resume yeah, sure. virtues and maybe contrast them with yeah. eulogy? I'd be happy to. So what David Brooks has in mind with the distinction between eulogy virtues and resume virtues, resume virtues would include anything that you would put on your resume to try to impress a, a potential employer. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good at uh, uh, public speaking. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a good thinker. Uh, I, I have a good personality. I interact well with people. Um, anything that would get you the job, but that's not necessarily uh, a deep character trait of a good sort like uh, honesty, uh, courage, faithfulness, uh, something that is more likely to come up at your memorial service than uh, how good you were at using Microsoft Word, you know, something like that. Sir. Thank you for saying thanks. Yes. Something we all agree about. Yes, yes. So to be able to basically come together as a community and make it a community-wide project that we can agree on, and then within that context, um, disseminate the information about civility and have it go out from that space, because not everyone's going to participate. It's the four elements within every community that wants harmony. Mm. Yeah, there are good. There are people in every community who really wish we could all get along better, uh, who don't want this uh, incivility, who want harmony. And you're suggesting that it would be good if we could get those people together and to focus on um, issues, problems that we agree about rather than ones we disagree about and uh, learn how to uh, communicate with each other, learn how to solve problems and, and also educate each other about civility. Uh, yes. Yeah, at, at least by modeling it for them. The process I have in mind is to empower the youth through a number of ways, which is, first of all, through the arts, music, dance, theater, science, and business, and using mentors to be able to, you know, mentor the youth, and then to be able to, to send this information out, to be able to, to you know, people will gravitate to this good. That sounds like a wonderful plan. I hope that uh, it that works well. Okay. And uh, I, I would just want to add to that that um, it would be good if we could get people together uh, who are different from each other, 
who don't agree with each other as well, because I, and, and not necessarily to talk initially about these issues that divide us, but just to get to know each other and to learn that this is a fellow human being that I might even like uh, before I find out that we have serious disagreements with each other about, uh, uh, about things. Because once you have that foundation of uh, respect and friendship, it's easier to talk to each other about these things. Yes? I just wanted to mention, I'm not from Santa Barbara. <clears throat> Welcome to Santa Barbara. Thank you. I'm visiting from Washington State, and I'm not aware of whether this kind of organization exists here, but in the community where I live, we have an organization called Civility First, hmm. with monthly meetings, hmm. uh, attempting to do exactly what you're talking about, Together and discuss civilly things we don't agree on necessarily. Wonderful. So, uh, from Washington State, you have a, a regular groups. Whidbey Island. Whidbey Island. Yeah. Whidbey Island. So she's saying that they, uh, in on Whidbey Island in Washington State, they have a regular group of uh, community group of getting together to talk about issues over which they do disagree uh, civilly, just to learn how to talk. That's great. That's great. And, and Civility first. You can find it on, online. Look online. Thank you. Yes, sir. Wouldn't you agree that one of the reasons people get so passionate and so dismissive of other viewpoints is that they have a genuine fear mm. that if that viewpoint turns into policy, mm. the world will collapse, whether it's climate change, <coughs> whether it's uh, racism. I mean, all, you know, and so is it... I mean, I'm not saying it's right to have mm. that fear, but don't you think that <coughs> fundamentally people, some, a lot of people just are really afraid of if that other person's policy gets enacted, and so then you have this win at all costs mm. mentality like, oh, the end justifies the means, so I'm going to be uncivil because that's going to be better for everybody in the end. Yeah. Good point. So the point here is that um, oftentimes people oppose positions because they're afraid that if they were put into po made into policy that it would really ruin things for all of us. And uh, I think I would just add to that that um, not only are a lot of these um, divisions driven by that kind of fear that you're talking about, but also, uh, as I said in, in my presentation, um, an assumption that anybody who would hold a view like that has to be a bad person. So that then we have a combination of fear about this proposal becoming policy and contempt for the person who's putting it forward. And then we're just being driven farther and farther apart. And it turns out now that the, the two political parties are not only divided politically, but tending to be divided religiously and in other ways as well. So our country is really being divided. When um, I think that maybe some of the, the, the fears could be alleviated at least, and the contempt could be hopefully diminished if, again, we just spent more time uh, listening to each other, trying to understand and appreciate each other, even if we don't end up agreeing with each other. Would you describe what you think of, of pale, the pale? Would you talk about the pale? Beyond the pale? Oh, beyond the pale. What would I consider to be, on the, be, to be beyond the pale? How did it originate? Oh, my. Well, uh, Rick Pointer, tell us how that originated. It actually uh, comes from the context of the English uh, creating uh, settlements and a kind of enclave in Ireland, which they considered to be the civilized part, and everything outside of that area, which was right around Dublin, which they created, were the barbaric Irish. And so it became the area the English controlled was called the Pale, and anything that was uncivilized and wild and um, something you didn't want to be if you were English was beyond the Pale. I knew I could count on my historian friend to <laughs> give us a good answer to that question. There's a Pale in Russia. There's also a Pale in Russia. There was. Oh. And, and so was there also a Beyond the Pale in Russia as well? Okay. The kindness method. Kindness, yes. And it's change your habits for good using self-compassion and understanding. 
Change your habits for good using self-compassion and understanding. understanding yeah, you know, I'm sure there are lots of resources like that out there to help people to um, deliberately work on uh, developing a better character. I hope more and more people do those kinds of things. I think we'd all be better off if they did. I'm not sure that even, that even if all of us improved our characters, that collectively speaking, it would make a huge cultural difference, unfortunately. The cultural forces are pretty uh, entrenched, I'm afraid. Yes? How do you account for the current appeal of uncivil behavior? Why people tend to gravitate toward it? We're talking about how civil behavior is self emulating. Why are we having this appeal of such uncivil Good question. I think it's because over time, the, uh, sorry, yes, thank you for, the, so the, here's the question. What do I think it is that accounts for the fact that so many people in our nation tend to be attracted to incivility, actually want to engage in it? Uh, what is it that's motivating them to do that? Seems to me that the answer to that is that as we've divided and, and as we've tended to vilify the other side, uh, we've tended to, to blame the other side for our troubles and to be resentful towards them. And there's actually um, uh, a French word, resentiment. I don't even know how to pronounce it, resentiment. Anyway, it's a political science category having to do with uh, people uh, in a nation, let's say, acting um, hatefully towards another group because out of resentment for a perceived wrong that's been done to them by this other group. And I think that's probably what explains a lot of incivility, that those people deserve it because look what they did to me. What about the idea that incivility pays? I mean, it gets you elected. Right, well, and at least uh, not necessarily with respect to uh, us non-politicians, but in, in the political sphere, it looks like over time now, and more recently, incivility has been working to get people elected. Uh, when you vilify your opponent, you're more likely to uh, win the contest, unfortunately. And, and the more that happens, the more it's reinforced, and the more people who uh, use incivility for that purpose are emboldened to do so, unfortunately. Yeah. And then, of course, that sets a bad example for the rest of us, and we all go down together. That's why I'm here today to try to turn the tide. Um. I think you're so right about civility, and I feel that that has to be sort of like the leaven in the bread that is going to spread over the whole nation. Um, and I think it can start with each one of mm. us, but I really feel very strongly that that's the way. There's some incredible books, uh, The Gentle Art of Blessing, mm. by Pierre Parmabon. It's wonderful. And I have found that it works, actually, small essence. But anyway, I feel that, um, well, I've had experiences where I have taken, uh, tried to f provide information, and uh, I tried to do it in a, a nice manner, and um, uh, what happened is the person got very mad mm. at this, because uh, what I did do was made a statement about what was factual, but it, it didn't go too well with this person. But I kept trying to keep my demeanor uh, gentle and nice. And what happened? A year later, this person changed their mind. And um, I think if I had got very strong in my argument, uh, it would never occur. Yeah, good. So here's, let me just repeat what he said. For one thing, he said he likes the idea of civility, and we, he hopes that it could be like leaven in, in dough to you know the, the, make everything rise. Um, and there's, there are some good resources out there uh, to help people to become more civil. And then he gave a little anecdote about a personal experience of saying something to someone who made them upset uh, and realizing that uh, because he was c continuing to be gentle with them in his answer, that, that over time uh, that person came around. And about a year later, you say. And you're thinking that if you had just argued instead of being gentle, uh, it wouldn't have worked out that way. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, the uh, biblical uh, proverb, a gentle answer turns away wrath, is illustrated here. Yes, ma'am. Just a comment. Yeah. 
Congratulations. Fifty, they've been married for 56 years. There must be a lot of civility in there, as a matter of fact, yeah. A common theme in our marriage and relationship is it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Ah, so important, yeah, that uh, we often might think that whatever we're saying is fine, but not realizing that we're saying it with a certain tone of voice, and that can certainly go a long way uh, in distancing people from each other, can't it? And so in our attempts to be civil, we have to remember, yeah, not only what, what we say, but how we say it as well. Take care. Uh, married 75 years. Married 75 years. Congratulations. I was married 70 years. The Depression. We're the wars have worn us down. We're not the same people we were 100 years ago. They went through a lot, and uh, I'm sure that there was a lot of character building going on throughout that process. Yeah. Being torn down. Yeah. By drugs. Hmm. Mm, yep. I was married 70 years, and this gentleman is absolutely correct. You start out as one person, each of you differently, and it's how you blend together through the years. And marriage is not a straight line. How you deal with the ups and downs has to do with character and respect. Yes, and so another comment made about being married a long time, in this case 70 years, and how 70. you're... 70. 70. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. Yeah. I, and how uh, you know you you will develop as a person over that period of time, and I think one of the best ways, one of the best character building uh, programs, is to get married. As a matter of fact, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm deeply grateful to my wife for helping me to become a better person. I think perhaps one of the most important things you address tonight is this idea of truth. What is truth, particularly in this age of social media? Now, uh, Donald Trump has been uh, recorded something like 16,000 untruths since he assumed the presidency. And uh, in, our, in talking with a good friend, examples, um, the other day, he's a medical doctor, believes that the uh, United States did not land a moon on the moon. It has not landed a man on the moon, ever. That that's a fallacy. And how do you then uh, reason with people who uh, literally uh, aren't interested in the truth, or maybe you don't even know the truth yourself because it's so muddled now. Yeah, good question. I think there's only so much you can do with someone who's uh, res resistant. Um, but I think all of us can take responsibility for becoming as informed as we can about things. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, learning again to respect the experts. Uh, when, when we can't figure out everything on our own, there are experts who we can turn to, and un unfortunately today, uh, a lot of experts in the sciences, for instance, are put into a, a bad light by, by many people, and that doesn't do us any good. So thank you for coming, and uh, I do appreciate how civil all of you were.